Good evening, everyone. Hello. My name is Nate Kings. I'm the Green Party's Democracy and Citizen Engagement spokesperson. I'm also a councillor in, in Newham in East London. Um, just so I can get a sense of this room, this is an event being organised by the Green Party, but not everybody here will be, hopefully at least, Green Party people. If you don't mind, could you put your hand up if you are, um, if you consider yourself to be part of the Green Party today? Brilliant. And if, and if you don't think of yourself as part of the Green Party? Very warm and friendly. Well, <laughs> fantastic. I'm taking notes and we'll change that. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. So we've got a good mix of people. I'm really happy about that. So I'm our party's uh, democracy spokesperson. Um, and it's really interesting being the Green Party's democracy spokesperson, because I like to think of every Green Party activist, every climate activist, as an activist for democracy. Because fundamentally, the climate crisis and our crisis in democracy are linked. Climate change has been allowed to happen the way that it has, because the people who are polluting our planet do not have to hear the voices of those who are most directly affected. And that's why we fundamentally have to change that if we want to stop climate change. Um, that being said, I wouldn't be doing my bit as a Green Party politician, I am a Green Party politician, without saying that Greens can win within the current climate, and if we want to change our political system, Greens have to win. It's not just that we can win, it's that we must win in order to save the, the planet and to save our democracy. We're, we're here in Hitchin, we're not far away from East Hearts, where the Green Party just gained 18 councillors in one... We, we won 19 councillors now and have gained, made 18 gains in, in one election. We're now the largest party and we, we, we need that council now. Um, Mid-Suffolk, we just gained a super majority on that council, the first time you know, we passed the majority for the first time ever, but we just didn't we just do that. We've now got a super majority. Things are changing. These are not places that you would traditionally think of as green heartlands. But people all over the country, for all sorts of reasons, are hearing the green message, and we're winning under the current system. So if you come here tonight thinking, "Oh, I really like the Green Party," but you know they're never going to win here, um, there are very few places left where the Greens are never going to win, um, and it's certainly not here. And in Newham, we, you know, that was a place that had, had uh, Labour single party state for decades. And if we can win there, electing me and my colleague, we can win anywhere, let me tell you that. So, as Greens, for the reasons that I said, we spend a lot of time thinking about democracy. And we have so many policies around how to fix our democracy. Right now, I'm involved in helping to write our manifesto for the next general election. The hard thing there isn't thinking about the great ideas to fix our democracy. Greens have been doing that for decades. It's how to get it on one or two pages so that our manifesto isn't a hundred pages long. Um, so, you know, if you've got your pet policies that are really important for you for democracy, please do let me know because they could go into our, uh, could influence what we put on our manifesto. But we're all, for, for the reasons that I said, campaigns for democracy. But what, you know, what does a representative democracy look like to the Green Party? And fundamentally, it does have to start with changing the electoral system. And it's not just because, you know, we hear all of these conversations about how many votes it takes to elect a Green MP or how fair it is for the Green Party. I want you to just get that argument out of your mind right away. It's not about what is fair for the Green Party or what is fair for the Liberal Democrats or, or anything like that. It's about what's fair for you, what helps your voice be heard. Because when it takes, you know, a million votes to elect a Green MP, that's hundreds of thousands of people whose voices aren't being heard. When millions uh, live in safe seats where their voice, their vote, never, is never going to count. It's their voice not being heard. It's not fair for them. It's not fair for you. And that's, that's what we um, think a lot about. And we have to change the electoral system because it stops things like climate change, which are fundamental to the future of our society. Uh, we like to say that you know, there's no economy on a bird planet. Uh, the, the electoral system has to change or we won't have those conversations. But that's just the first thing, you know, the Green Party has um, plans for radical devolution, to have decisions made by the people that are affected by those decisions, rather than far away in, in Westminster, decisions made locally for local people, by local people, because you know what you need in your society, in your community. Uh, votes at 16 and residence-based voting rights are so important. Nobody who
who has a stake in our society should have their voice excluded. People like to say young people don't know what they're talking about. You know, I'm sat here, I like to think that I know a little bit about what we're talking about, and lots of bullying young people do. And actually, if you're, the first time you're voting is within, when you're within an education system, that system can support people, it can give citizen, citizenship education, and that's so important as well. Um, that's, the, you know, that's the Green Party perspective. But we also really care about working with other political parties. That, you know, we work a lot with Compass for that, for that reason, because it, there is no monopoly on wisdom. No one party, no one person has the answer to all of the problems that we have as a society. Um, I heard some people earlier just before talking about a progressive alliance. Put your hand up if you know what that means, what a progressive alliance is. This idea that parties stand down in different parts of the country to narrow the choice to, to voters to make sure that a progressive candidate can win. We, we, we saw that happen in 2017 and 2019. Greens have um, been really open to the idea in the past. Um, and you know, if, if Labour or the Liberal Democrats or any other party wants to come to us and start that conversation now, we can have it. It's a way of trying to make the progressive majority that exists in this country be expressed through our two-party political system. But unfortunately, you know, we stood down in hundreds of constituencies across the country in 2017. That cost the Green Party money because we get votes. We get political parties get money based on how many votes they get. That literally cost the party thousands of pounds. People lost their job. We did that to try and show that things can be different. And unfortunately, we've never had any kind of reciprocation from from Labour on that. So unfortunately, where we're at right now, it doesn't look likely that that's going to happen again. But if that's something that you're interested in, talk to people in Labour about it. Because that's, you know, our door is open. Come to us and we'll have that conversation. Um, but yeah, we care about pluralism. We care about working with other political parties. And, you know, we've got that represented on our panel here today. So we've got, um, in order, um, I'll introduce them and then they'll have some time to speak um, about what they're doing in there situation uh, and in their organization. So for Make Votes Matter, we've got Ian. Um, Ian's been a, a lifetime campaigner for uh, electoral reform and a corporate governance specialist. Um, and, and he's going to talk to us about the key to a, to a true representative democracy. From Unlock Democracy, we've got um, Sean Roberts, who's um, the director of campaigning for digital. Uh, and he's a, a charity and political campaigner for over 30 years. Um, uh, and, and he's going to talk to us about the first rule about democracy. And then, uh, last thing, and certainly not least, least we've got um, Neil Lawson from Compass, who I've mentioned. Um, he's been a Labour member since he was 16, speechwriter for Gordon Brown, um, trade unionist, um, and he's going to speak about the campaigns from Compass. And he's, he knows about the conversation in Labour about electoral reform, so we're really interested to hear from him. But first, uh, we've got Ian from Make Us Matter. Okay. Thank you very much indeed for your um, introduction. Thank you for your invitation uh, as well this evening. In the biographical note about me that's in the information tonight, based on the words that I sent to Dear Linda uh, a few weeks ago, um, I've referred to a lifetime, lifetime commitment to campaigning to change our electoral system. Ever since I took an interest in politics as a teenager and in various guises as a political activist, right at the centre of my political convictions has been the belief that so much that is wrong with our politics in the UK is to do with the electoral system that we use. And I have that central conviction because I give very emphatic answers to two closely related and pertinent questions. Can it be justified in a democracy that the minority have absolute power over the, over the majority? Can it be justified in a democracy that a political party that only receives a minority of the vote is given power over the land and over all of us? But this is something that happens at every general election in the UK. The party, a party with a minority of the vote is given absolute power over all of us. You would have to go back to 1935 
to find a general election when the government was elected with an actual majority of the votes. There are some people still around from 1935. 1935 is still within living memory for some people, but we can say with confidence there's nobody around today who actually voted in the 1935 general election. The system that we have today is because of our first-past-the-post electoral system. Make Votes Matter is a pressure group that wants to change that system, to move to an electoral system that is based on proportional representation, with the simple, laudable, democratic aim that representation in Parliament is in accordance with how people vote. Now, it's worthwhile just focusing on why we get this anomaly in our electoral system. For the reason that you will be familiar with, but it's worthwhile concentrating on the central fault and charting out from there all of the consequences of that. When we go to vote in the general election, as you know, we don't elect the Prime Minister directly or the government, we go to elect our local member of parliament. And all a candidate has to do in order to be elected is to win the largest share of the vote, not necessarily a majority of the votes. It's always been the case under our system. The problem is that today there are so many more candidates in elections, so many more political parties, that the ability to win an election constituency on a small share of the vote is now much more than it was. If you're as geeky as me, you might know about the 1951 general election. It was the general election that Clement Attlee lost against Winston Churchill. In that general election, nearly 97% of people voted Conservative or Labour. About 2% voted Liberal. So you could just about say that in those days you could defend the system even when Labour got its big majority in 1945, it still didn't get more than 50% of the vote. In fact, it's a real quirk of our electoral system that Labour got its most votes in that 1951 election that it lost, and the Conservatives got less votes than them, and they won, and Mr. Churchill came back into office. The Liberal Party just about held on with about 2% of the vote, and since then, the Liberal Party, the Liberal Democrats as their successors, have gained a greater share of the vote. And, of course, over the years, more political parties have joined the uh, British politics, the Green Party, the Scottish National Party, UKIP, the Brexit Party, and others. So again, the ability for a candidate to win a small share of the vote is much more today is much more today than it used to be. In fact, out of three of the five last general elections, the majority of votes went to losing candidates in the election. And it's, it isn't just about what votes being wasted on losing candidates. Wait, votes get wasted on winning candidates as well. Under first past the post, in order for somebody to be uh, uh, elected, they need to get the largest share of the vote. So in one constituency, somebody may have a very large majority. In another constituency, somebody may win with a very small majority. But the outcome under our system is the same. Each constituency elects one member of parliament. But all of those votes that have piled up for the winning candidate have not, in effect, had any outcome, any effect on the outcome of that election. Piling up votes for a winning candidate is just as wasteful as those votes that go to the losing candidates. <coughs> uh, the last general election in 2019, around 71% of votes were wasted in that sense. 71% of our votes that had no effect on the outcome of the general election. Many of us are represented by a member of parliament who does not represent us, or our values. It includes me. I have an interest in politics. I sometimes communicate with my member of parliament on political issues. We disagree. He doesn't see my point of view. I don't feel he's someone I can really go to. Now that's all undemocratic at a local level, but the consequences of that 
get escalated up our system of politics. It means that the so-called small parties in our political system, the Greens, the Liberal Democrats, UK, Brexit, Reform Party, these parties may not have a great deal in common with each other, or two may not have much in common with one, but at the last general election, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the Brexit Party, between them got about 5.2 million votes. About a 16% vote share in the general election, but the representation in Parliament for that was about 2%. In fact, that's nearly all Liberal Democrats. The Liberal Democrats have learned how to work the system over the years so that even in a bad year for them, they can hold on to a handful of seats. So mainly, or nearly all Liberal Democrats, um, one Green MP, the fantastic Caroline Lucas, uh, no members of Parliament uh, for, the, uh, for the Brexit Party. So the ability of those voters, through their representatives, to influence decision-making in the House of Commons is limited because they don't have the representation that their votes merit. But we would argue that their influence is actually zero because the other side of this coin is just as, just as those parties, the smaller parties, are underrepresented for their support, so the larger parties are overrepresented for their support. And at each general election, either the Conservative Party or the Labour Party has been allocated an overall majority in the House of Commons based on a minority of the vote to wield that absolute power from a minority position that I was referring to at the beginning. The current government got less than 44% vote share at the last general election. Incidentally, we've been hearing so much about Boris Johnson recently, about how what a great vote winner he is. He only actually improved the Conservative vote in the 2019 election by 1.2% over what Theresa May achieved in 2017. That big increase with the Conservative Party was because of the workings of our electoral system and the fact that the Brexit Party stood down candidates. It's not the worst example, incidentally. The worst example, I think, in post-war history was the Labour Party under Tony Blair winning the 2005 general election with a 35% vote share. A whacking great 65% of people did not vote Labour, but we got a majority Labour government, a 60-plus majority. It's completely unjustifiable. And the problem with this is that it, it, it creates this artificial competition in the House of Commons that has no relationship to the true variety of political opinion out in the country. We have a government that then sets policies and priorities with reference to that artificial competition. And it's worthwhile mentioning here too the way in which general elections are fought in this country. Because general elections are really fought in our marginal seats. Those seats that actually change hands between the parties. And it can take a very small number of votes for seats to actually change hands. So in a general election, all of the campaigning by the political leaders, the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition and their colleagues, you'll find them in those marginal constituencies. Because we have these so-called safe seats, the majority, um, throughout the country. And <coughs> the interest of our political leaders is in the concerns of those voters in those constituencies. That's their incentive. That's the way in which this system works. It's why now we are continually reminded about the views and the concerns and sensitivities of voters in those so-called red wall seats. We believe that every vote should count equally. Our politicians should be focused on the concerns of everybody in the country, not just the concerns of those people in those marginal constituencies. This artificial situation that is set up in Parliament 
means that our differences are exaggerated. We have differences as a population, you know from your families and your work colleagues, but they are not as great as the picture would have you believe from the way in which political representation is set up in Westminster. We have this deep polarisation in our politics at Westminster. Whose side are you on? It's Labour or Conservative, primarily. And words like compromise, common ground, respecting other people's points of view, these are words of weakness in our political system because of the political culture that's been shaped by first past the post. It is really something that warps the way in which all of the great issues of our day and in the past have been considered. You look at any big issue, um, income inequality, um, transport, whatever it is, it, it, it will be warped by the way in which our representation is set up at Westminster. We may talk about more in subsequent discussion. Let me just, let's just take one example. The position of Scotland in the United Kingdom. Now you may be in favour of independence for Scotland, against it. You may be concerned about the future of the United Kingdom. But the great problem is that the chances of having a sensible discussion about Scotland and its future constitutional position and the future of the UK, again, is warped by our electoral system. We had the SNP hugely overrepresented at Westminster. Or seems to be fair to the SNP, they are in favour of proportional representation. That's the system that they work under. So we had this almost exclusive nationalist voice coming from Scotland hitting this rigid pro-union status quo at Westminster that's very dismissive of issues and concerns of people in Scotland. The chances of having a sensible discussion in all of this is quite minimal. I think as we've seen, whenever this issue has come up, certainly in the Westminster context, if we had proportional representation, then the true political variation in Scotland would be represented at Westminster. The House of Commons itself would be much more balanced. And then we could come closer together. I'm just using this as one example. But we can come closer together in discussing what our future constitutional arrangements may be. What would be the chances of compromise? What are the chances of other ways? But the chances of having that discussion in our system is very difficult, again, because our differences are really, really exaggerated. People in Scotland, obviously they feel that the, the political culture at Westminster is completely alien to them. But it shouldn't be. That's a completely artificial setup because of our electoral system. And if we had PR, if we had a more balanced situation at Westminster, then people in Scotland wouldn't feel that Westminster politics was so, was so far away. And that would help the debate as well. We do have a very adversarial political system. Politicians are very rude about each other. Um, Westminster is sort of set up as theatre and pantomime. Look at the way in which a Prime Minister is judged to have done well at PMQs. It isn't that he goes there and gives well-informed answers to questions put to him by the leader of the opposition. It's him being able to demonstrate that he has the wherewithal and wit of a stand-up comedian. That he can, you know, put down the leader of the opposition, deal with the hecklers, make his backbenchers laugh and cheer. It's not serious politics, and it's no wonder that people feel so disengaged from our politics. And if you look at the statistics, the level of engagement and participation that people have in systems with proportional representation is much higher. Well, I would say it is quite considerably higher than it is in countries like us that have first past the post. Just consider for one moment, if we conducted ourselves in our everyday lives, 
the way politics is conducted at Westminster. If in our marriages, relationships, workplaces, societies, clubs, wherever it may be, we said, do you know what, it's only my opinion that counts. And not only is it only my opinion that counts, I'm going to be pretty rude about what you think. I'm going to be very disrespectful about your values and your principles. Well, we don't do that in everyday life, simply because we can't do that in everyday life. We know that the, the reality of everyday life is that we do have to negotiate with our partners. We do have to navigate around the balance of power in workplaces and all of that kind of thing. But that's not the reality of Westminster. This issue about the absence of compromise and seeking common ground in our system is one of the big arguments that touches on, is one of the big issues that touches on one of the big arguments that is put forward against proportional representation. And we may talk in subsequent discussion about all of the arguments for and against it. But opponents of PR say, well, if you've got PR, no one party's got a majority, you can't get agreement, uh, it's a very unstable situation. It is not true. If you look at countries with proportional representation, they have greater political stability than we do. On average, we have one, unplan one unplanned election more uh, every 10 years in our system than countries with PR um, do. But I would point to examples from our system as well. Look at the coalition government between the Lib Dems and the Tories between 2010 and 2015. Now, you may have hated that government. You may have supported that government, very few here tonight, I guess. You may have had mixed views about that government. But the one thing you cannot say about that government was that it lacked stability. Or indeed, it was indecisive. You can have different decisions with a, one part, with a party that's a government is based on one party. The, the decisions are different, but they're no less decisive because the parties come together, they agree a programme, and they put it into action. The other example that is used, which I always find really, really interesting, is that people point to that period between the general election in 2017 and the end of 2019 when we had a minority Conservative government and we had all the chaos over Brexit. And again, the opponents of PR will say, well, look what happened there. Um, Brexit got stuck. Um, no one could agree or compromise with each other. It took Boris Johnson to come through, get his majority and to get Brexit done. I actually think that situation was an argument for proportional representation. Yes, it's true that PR produces a situation where no one party has a majority. But the difference with proportional representation is that the political culture changes. Politicians have to compromise. They have to collaborate because there's no general election that can take you out of that situation. That was the difference in that parliament. Because there was a way out, and the long shot for that group in the Conservative Party, the hardline Brexiteers, was that they could get a new leader, get to a general election, fight a general election, not on the basis of a referendum where every vote counts, but under first past the post, where they can win on the minority of the vote. And of course, all of that paid off. That couldn't have happened under PR. Under PR, they would have been forced to compromise. And I would speculate along these lines. If that had been a PR situation, they would have had to compromise, and they would have had to have compromised over something that was a real substantial compromise, a lasting compromise, because it would have to appeal to the people outside. And that could have been a compromise, for example, around continued membership in the single market. But instead what we got, supposedly, was getting Brexit done. But the reality was that Brexit was done on the basis of quite a partisan position. And as we know, it wasn't really done in the end. Uh, I'll just conclude my comments in a minute by talking about what we consider to be the route to PR, but as Boris Johnson has been so much in the, the news over the past couple of days, it's also worth mentioning something uh, about the way in which power is abused in this country. 
I wouldn't particularly single out this, this government for the abuse of power, but when you have a Prime Minister like Boris Johnson, who is, I am here in a non-partisan capacity, I have to be careful what I say, but someone who is casual, relaxed about our constitu constitutional norms and boundaries, it really gets, it really brings home to you the, the potential for the abuse of power in our current system. Politicians may persuade themselves that they're doing the right thing, but it's clear that power can be abused. And it was abused. I think proportional representation is part of the answer to that. It's not the, it's not the complete answer. I think there are other changes in our constitutional arrangements that are necessary. But the one thing that the PR would mean is we would avoid a situation in the future where one party has absolute power on the basis of a minority of the vote. It's undemocratic, and I think we've seen some of the consequences of that over the past few years. Will we get PR? Make Votes Matter works with a big array of other organisations, including uh, Compass, the Green Party is part of that um, a progressive partnership. Um, one of the things we've done is to broker an agreement between all of our partners on what a good electoral system looks like. We don't actually recommend a particular form of proportional representation, but we've brokered something called the Good Systems Agreement, which lists all of the features of what we think a good electoral system looks like. Maintaining a constituency link, link. People being able to vote for people and not uh, for parties. Proportionality, of course. If you go to our website, you can read the whole document. And we also believe that the route to agreeing on a form of, an, on a form of electoral uh, reform is via a deliberative process like a citizen's assembly, not a crude referendum. A citizen's assembly, which has worked well on some issues in the Republic of Ireland, and in some other countries. The big prize, of course, is to persuade one of the major political parties to support this. We've made brilliant head, well, I say we, activists in the Labour Party have made great uh, headway inside the Labour Party. I'm sure Neil is going to comment on that, and I'll need him to talk about that and the, the prospects of, of Labour coming round to, to uh, PR in the future. What I would say, finally, is that to all of you um, in the Green Party, as I say to anyone else who's got support for, pro 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 support for proportional representation um, in their armory of policies, is that think about campaigning and working for this even more than you do. Because I think if we achieve electoral reform, it's going to rank with the Great Reform Acts, votes for women, the equalisation of votes for men and women as one of the big landmark changes in the development of our democracy. That's worth committing your time and your effort to. And um, we need to send a message to those political leaders who are most likely to be on the side of that change. Show some more courage and less caution. Thank you. so much Ian, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, I hope lots of people have lots of questions because that was a fantastic uh, contribution to the conversation. I particularly liked, well I liked a lot of what you said, but I, I particularly liked what you said about how the electoral system is giving one party absolute power and to achieve change you have to convince that one party. You don't have to convince society and even convincing society isn't enough you have to convince this one of the two major parties. And what that made me realize is the campaign for PR, what we're having to do, shows why PR is so necessary itself. Because it doesn't matter that overwhelming numbers of people support proportional representation as a majority in society, in whichever way you measure it at this point. But that doesn't matter. It's, we, all, we could change the electoral system without that. Because all it takes is to change the views of one political party, and I think that's broken in both ways. You should 
It, should, it shouldn't matter what one political party thinks. It should matter what 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 people think. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you for that contribution and hope there's lots of questions. I'm gonna introduce our next speaker. Um, we now have Sean from. I guess I'll leave it over here as well. Right, I can see this is going to be a very controversial evening with speakers really kind of going against each other. Um, I was kind of like going tick, tick, as <laughs> he was going through that. But no, thanks, Ian. Um, it was really good. Um, thank you for having us. Um, that's really good uh, to be here. Um, Unlock Democracy, we've been around for about 16 years now. Uh, we were formed out of two organisations, one called the New Politics Network, which was curiously the descendant of the British Communist Party. Interesting. Uh, and the other was Charter 88, um, which was a body set up in the 1980s campaign for a, a written constitution and you know, major democratic changes. And for many years, was a huge campaign in, in this country and actually had quite a lot of influence on the Labour in the 1990s and that first Blair government. But it, obviously, it did not go as far as we would like to see. We are a small non profit. Um, and we are absolutely not party political in any way, shape or form, so I won't get onto anything about progressive alliances and I'll try and keep my own personal views separate from the organisation tonight. Um, as we sort of said, I am uh, the Director of Campaigns and Digital. I've been here for about two and a half years. I'm not democracy. It's been a really interesting time to be working in this space. Um, you know, it's, it, sometimes democracy can be like, quite quiet as an issue, not on the headlines at all. And this last city three years, I think, it's just like day after day after day of just absolute chaos. Um, and so it's been, it's been fascinating. And, you know, as, as mentioned, I've, I've been a campaigner kind of all my life as well. Um, and when you're a campaigner, you're kind of operating within the system. Uh, you are playing the game. You are trying to make the system work for you as best as possible to win uh, elections or to win uh, a campaign or a a call, win for a cause, and you don't actually spend that much time sort of standing back from the system and just saying, hey, what is this like? And these last three years have been like really <laughs> eye-opening for me because I knew the system wasn't brilliant. I had no idea, in all honesty, just how dysfunctional politics in this country has become and how broken this system that we have in front of us. So in terms of the question of tonight, you know, representative democracy, do we need it? And what should it look like? The answer is yes, and nothing like this. <laughs> um, nothing like this. Um, and when I say that, I mean, the events of the last five years in particular, possibly since Brexit, I think, since the that referendum, which is seven years ago now, I mean, it has just been crazy. Um, but we're not going to have a functional democracy in the UK until the votes cast matched the seats won in our elections. We won't have a functional democracy um, until the people who vote, actually vote in those elections, is actually reflective of the wider population. You know, there are around nine million people in this country who aren't even on the electoral register. I mean, it's shocking. Um, we're not gonna have a functional democracy all the time. We have second chamber, with hereditary peers, political appointees, bishops. This is not a functional democracy. And we won't have a functional democracy all the time. We have a political system that hoards, actually hoards unearned power at the very top with almost no safeguards, no kind of oversight, um, checks and balances that have just been proved to be completely inadequate over these last few years. And finally, we can't have a, a, a political system that ignores so many of the big issues facing the country and just fails to tackle. Climate's one of those, but think about you know, the crisis in care. Um, so many big issues. Our political system just ignores it. And it just goes on. And these problems just sit there and they get worse. And so we, what we have in this country, it's not a representative democracy, it's dysfunctional democracy. So, we, as an organisation, we believe we, we want a democracy that works. Um, and we believe in representative democracy, but we also believe in deliberative democracy as well. We think actually the two work very well hand in hand together. Um, you know, it, it, it's quite, quite interesting when you get into the sort of democracy campaign areas. There's, um, <laughs> there's, 
there's uh, the deliberative democracy people and, and uh, representative democracy people can get into quite spicy fights uh, about which is best. And I, I don't really hold to that. I mean, I really equate that to the, you know, if you're trying to choose between two types of democracy, you're really trying to choose between like wind power or solar power. Um, they, they, we need both. <laughs> both comfort. And what they actually deliver is what the people want. So um, we're not uh, an organisation that goes for one or the other. We think the two things go well together. So what do we want? Um, it's change. The political system has to change. Um, I might have got out of order there, sorry. <laughs> if you might, I just probably just make the speech shorter, which is great. So what do we want? We want PR. I mean, PR is, is as just been said, the most transformational change that would actually move things in our electoral system. And uh, I love it because you use the word culture, and I've got culture. You know, it's not just changing the electoral system, it changes how we do politics. Uh, and I met someone uh, in Scotland who was telling me about PR at local elections in Scotland. And he said, we used to knock on the doors of a voter, and if they said, I'm voting SNP, you'd go, I off. You wouldn't have a conversation with them or anything like that. They're not supporting my party, I'm off this doorstep. But when you have PR, they have second preferences and third preferences. So you actually have a conversation. And that, he, he was sort of saying, is one of the most transformational things that he, he found that we actually had talking to people from other parties. Imagine that. Um, and that's good. And it, the second thing, uh, example I'll give. It, at the moment, our politics is dominated by cliques. cliques. Um, who's heard of Stevenage Woman and Workington Man? So the Labour Party a few weeks ago uh, pretty much announced that you know, the next election is about Workington Man and Stevenage Woman. Um, and everything that the political parties are doing, particularly Labour at the minute, is kind of like... Well, what does Steve Woman think of this? What does Working Sid Man think of this? It's red wall, blue wall. Um, what about everyone else? No, they don't matter. And what first past the post does is drives people to finding that little wedge of people that will move, and it just ignores everyone else. And that is not good, and that needs to change. And as we said, actually, parties working together, <coughs> talking to each other, finding common ground, Resolving arguments in the way that we would do in real life could only be a, a really good thing, and we think that would be a, an amazing change to our politics. And you know, it's something that could be done so quickly. Um, the second area that we we really want to work we work on is about devolution. We are the most centralised country in Europe, and it's you know we used to talk about power being sort of hoarded in Westminster, but it's gone way beyond that now. It's actually all been hoarded into one house in the middle of Westminster. If you're an MP today, you are pretty much sidelined, particularly when there's a big majority like there is right now. MPs have little power. Even ministers today seem to have little power because everything's been hoarded right up to the very top. You know, the Prime Minister's office, the operation in Downing Street has grown many times over in these last few years. So, you know, this centralization has now gone to such a crazy degree. Um, that we have to do something about it. We need to get power back down, you know, out of out down the street, into ministries, into parliament, down to councils, into communities, and that's the kind of thing that will make a real difference. And I'll just say, I mean, I, I was recently elected a councillor um, last month um, in central Bedfordshire nearby, um, and one of the biggest concerns my residents have is about health services. What as a councillor, can I do about that? The answer really is not a lot, although we're going to try anyway. Because health services are controlled by a health board. Okay, who's the health board accountable to? Who can talk to that? Well, the answer is actually no one. The government sets it up, the government funds it, council can't hold it accountable, MPs can't hold it accountable. And this is the, the kind of democratic deficit that exists. People want to say, I want things to change. Well, we need to actually make, make sure that people that are elected have the opportunity to do that. And having something as important as health, almost existing separate to any kind of democratic structure, is no way to run things. 
And so there's lots of change we want to see there. And just moving on, cleaning up politics is a, is a very sort of big line. Uh, you know, there's always been sleet in politics, and um, obviously these last few days it's been back in the news, and you know, it's power and sleet often just come together. Um, you know, Lloyd George is very famous for actually selling peerages over a hundred years ago. This is not anything new. But the problem is, no one ever does anything about it. And we just go round and round in circles. And we believe it's time now that we actually have an independent process that actually oversees the behaviour of our MPs, our ministers. The, the, what we've had in these last two years, Boris Johnson uh, has to decide, if, some of the, if, if one of the ministers misbehaved from Boris Johnson was Prime Minister, Boris Johnson would have, would have to say, oh yes, we can have an investigation on that. Then the, the, his independent standards advisor would do the investigation. And then Boris Johnson would then decide on the sentencing or the, <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of the person at the end of it. And of course, the biggest complaint that was going on there was about Boris Johnson. How can you imagine that kind of system existing in any other walk of life? Um, so we need an independent process that really you know, basically takes control of behaviour and standards at Westminster. So we, you know, I'm fed up of reading stories about MPs and second jobs. Uh, you know, Boris, I keep using Boris Johnson as an example, but he's not the only example by any means. But MPs who should be at work, Suddenly, well, I'm a celebrity getting out of here or well, on their own talk show. I mean, they are there to be MPs. That is not good. Um, and you know, whether it's corruption or it's sleaze, we have to do something about that. Because this, when you actually ask people out there, the number one concern about their politicians right now is actually about honesty. They don't feel they can trust them. And we have to do something that restores that, com that confidence so we can uh, move forward. And finally, we need uh, a written constitution, which is something that Unlock Democracy has campaigned for for many, many years. And while a written constitution can sound a little bit dry, you're not going to see many people wandering up the street through big placards, we need a written constitution now. But what a written constitution can do for this country is basically be the rule book that, ex that exists that controls our politics. At the moment, our politics is kind of like a free-for-all. Um, there are no rules that are written down and set, set and consequently, when someone thinks, hey, I'm going to ignore that rule, um, they can most of the time, and they get away with it. And so what we want to see is a written constitution produced out of the deliberative process, so we involve the people to decide what it needs to do, that protects our rights, it restricts government power, and actually just lays down the rules through which our democracy works, because uh, we think that would be a big improvement. So, we could talk for ages and we could have lots of agreement about what we need to do. The real question is how do we get it? Uh, and that just sort of ties it back to the first rule about getting people interested in democracy is don't use the word democracy. Democracy is it's a wonderful thing we love it, and you know, my organisation is called Unlock Democracy. But when you're actually trying to get people out there engaged with democracy, when you say you ask, you ask the question, um, uh, yeah, is Britain a democratic country? The answer is yes. Most people are going to say yes. I would happily say not right now, we're not. But most people will say yes. And the reason for this is they'll say, well, I get to vote every four years. Um, it's not like we're China or Iran. And that's the, the prism through which they see the word democracy. They see the institution. But if you ask them then, what do you think about politics and the political system in this country? Oh my goodness, it's terrible. Uh, and it's a completely different reaction. So our mission <laughs> for these coming years, if we want to deliver PR, because uh, as has been said, Labour have made, well, people within Labour have made huge progress. The membership, massively in favour of PR and, and many of, on many other democratic reforms. Trade union movement has come a long, long way and is now majority support. The one group we've got to get in the Labour Party still is the leadership and, and quite a lot of the elected um, MPs. Quite an important group. 
who will they listen to? The only people they will really listen to are the people out there, the voters. And we have to drive up the concerns with the political system up their list of concerns. You know, we don't want, too often you can get uh, a politician to say, well, no one ever writes to me about constitution reform. No one ever writes to me about democracy. <coughs> and it's quite often it's true because that's not what they're saying. Um, but what they will be saying is, I can't get things done. Um, you know, my life, you know, things are not working in this country. Uh, all these are in fact democracy issues. And if we want to kind of get more people out there talking about these issues, then we need to talk about, use the right kind of language that engages with them on these issues. So, what we have to do, I mean, what we often fall into as democracy campaigners is that we spend a lot of time trying to explain how the system's supposed to work. We'd like to explain how the electoral system should work. I mean, who could, uh, do people remember the referendum on AV, which is very much not PR, we should be very clear. What the most one-sided referendum I think we've ever seen in this country. Um, I believe that the government paid to have a booklet sent to all the homes across the country explaining how AV would work. Um, strangely, that wasn't very effective as a campaign technique. And the truth is, people don't really want to know how it works. They want to know how it, what it will deliver. You know, in order to get people to support action on climate change, they don't need to understand the science, they just need to understand there's a problem, and if we don't do something about it, we're not going to get the solution we want at the end. And we as democracy campaigners, Green Party, Liberal Democrats, Labour, and some Conservatives as well, need to really adopt the right kind of language and talk about the kind of outcomes that PR, devolution, House of Lords reform, all these other incredibly important issues, what they can and will deliver. So, does people know politics is broken? There's no argument. One of the most unifying things you can say right now but we'll have the most agreement from people is politics isn't working. Labour, Lib Dem, Tory, Brexit, Leave, old, young, will agree with that. Everyone knows it's a problem. What we've got to do is try and get them to see it's a problem we have to solve. And it's connected to so many of the other problems we've got in our, town, in our country right now. So, we need to make politics work. We need to show people politics can work. Real democracy is not a given. Just look at what's going on in the US, what's happened in Hungary. Um, you know, this is not something we can ever take for granted. And what we've seen over years and years now is either no reform to our politics or actually things being rolled back. That has to change. These next, whoever the next government is, this is one of the most critical things uh, that needs to happen. We've got to have a political system that tackles the issues facing our country and our planet. And we need a system that protects our rights and give, gives us good governance and gets the country working again. And it's up to people like all of you and all of us to try and make that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean. That was, that was incredibly interesting. Um, and you hit on something that happens a lot as a Green Party spokesperson for democracy. And, and what lots of other democracy campaigners in the Green Party say is that actually every time we want to say the UK is not a democracy, there's a little bit of fear that like people won't quite believe you or people will think that you're a bit mad. But when you walk it through the issues like the issues like you just have, it is so clear that the UK is not a democracy. When you look at what what does being a democracy mean to you, actually think about that. Think about you know, is my voice heard? Do the things that happen in my community, are they the things that my community wants to happen? Can I make a change both at the ballot box and uh, outside of it? And the answer to all of those questions in the UK is, is no. And what you said about how um, democracy is not a given, it, it's not just that, you know, we're campaigning to make things better, it's because there are people on the other side campaigning to make them a, a lot worse because they know that their interests are not the same as the interests of society as a whole. And so they're trying to bend the system to their will. So it's not enough just to say, actually, what we have now is fine. We actively have to fight for more democracy every day, or we're going to lose what we already have. So thank
thank you for articulating that really, really well. Um, next up, we've got last scene, and certainly not least, we've got Neil Wilson, who is the director of Compass. Thanks, mate. Um, you'll be really glad to know that um, uh, Ian and Sean have said everything, so I don't have to say very much. Um, I'm worried about you. I'm more worried about the bloke doing the filming because he bored witness by all of this. So I won't speak for, 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 for too long because um, they were two of the best speeches I've heard about the case for change and why we need PR. In particular, let me just say, first of all, thank you very much to dear Linda and Mary and anyone else who's involved in organising tonight, because I know how much work goes into um, these kind of meetings, so thank you for doing that. And also thank you for Nate as well for chairing it. We've got a real political star of the future in the Green Party there, so I'm going to watch that kind of career in the nicest possible sense of career happen, because he's a real, real talent, so watch out for, for Nate and what he's going to do for the Green Party and democracy and better politics in our country. And there's one other person I just wanted to mention um, before I get into some of this. Um, uh, someone, it, it's not really hard not to sort of sound like their obituary, um, but Caroline Lucas retired, announced their retirement from politics last week. And um, I kind of saw it coming, I know Caroline quite well, I'm lucky enough to, and I sort of saw it coming and knew it was probably inevitable, but it still sort of shook, shook me a bit. Because when you've got this shining light of a person that was such a great politician, kind of had all of those talents of being both, you know, humble and bold, you know, generous and caring and daring and all the things that you need. And, like, you see a system that should be embracing someone like Caroline Lucas and putting her centre stage. I had the honour of writing something for The Guardian, and I said that she was the best Prime Minister we never had. And I kind of, you know, I hold that, you know, and believe that. And I see a system that kind of rejects someone like her rather than embraces her. And she had a profound impact on me, but not just personally, but, but, but Compass as well. Compass died 20 years ago inside the Labour Party, trying to make the Labour Party better. You can tell whether we've succeeded with that or not. Uh, you want, uh, what a waste of 20 years, maybe. Um, but in 2011, we put a vote to our members and said, should we carry on broadly being an inside the Labour Party organisation, or should we open out and say, if you believe in our good society, one which is much more equal, democratic and sustainable, then you're in. And um, our members voted for that, despite being primarily or, or exclusively Labour, Labour members. And the person that was in our mind all the time was Caroline Lucas. Why would you call, keep Caroline Lucas out of Compass, but let Peter Mandelson in? And that didn't make any sense to us, really. And the whole kind of breadth and scale of the changes and the challenges and the opportunities we've got, how is one single narrow party ever going to navigate all of that complexity and all of that breadth and all of that scale without bringing in people like Caroline Lucas or bringing in people like Sean from the Liberal Democrats or people from no party? Do you want a good society? Are you willing to do something about it when you're in? Caroline Lucas was the person who uh, you know, inspired us to, to change, our, change our rules. Um, look, um, I've never known a moment of such kind of fear and hope. You know, the best of times, the worst of times, a perma-crisis world of obviously climate change, of tech, of, of ageing, of inequality. So many things cascading around and kind of beating us down and worrying us and making us feel insecure. Alongside of politics, as Ian and Sean have said, that is so hopelessly fit for purpose to deal with all of that perma-crisis stuff that's going to keep coming down the track, geopolitics, all the rest of it, Ukraine, what's going to happen with China, you know, etc, etc. Our politics can't deal with this stuff for all the reasons, and I'm not going to rehearse it uh, for what Ian uh, and Sean said. They're kind of adversarial, short-term, tribal, narrow, nature, the monopolistic. How do you, how's a monopoly ever going to work, you know, and deal with all of that kind of uh, uh, complexity? You, you never build a good society on bad politics, and for all the reasons we've heard, these are really kind of terrible politics. And I just wanted to say something about the Greens in that, because we know the figures about 850,000 per, per MP. Um, but it was a kind of our experience of working with Greens that sort of taught us, and listening to people like Molly and talking to others, about how bloody wretched the electoral system is for the Green Party. Because it doesn't just kind of not count your votes there. It means that because of the generosity of Greens in standing aside and voting tactically, 
that you're not second in anywhere near enough places the next time either. So you're in this perpetual loop of never quite getting there, of never having the recognition and the support um, that you need. And then personally in 2017, as Nate was referring to, you know, there was about 40 seats, you know, generously, beautifully, wonderfully. Greens stood aside and said, no, it's so important to get rid of the, you know, the Conservatives. We've got this kind of good guy, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, apparently. You know, let's stand aside and let them through. And it broke my heart, the Labour Party member, that the Labour Party never, ever recognised what those people did, how generous and supportive they were, how they put the country and the country's needs before their own party. And Labour never said thank you. And that kind of, like, I mean, I have to say it disgusted me, really. A party that claims to be one of, you know, a party of solidarity, you know, didn't thank the Greens. And I think we've got to really think our way round. How do we both get rid of the Conservatives, but help the Green Party and help the Liberal Democrats and others break through this awful, abusive political system? Because that's what it is. That's the bit that first past the post does, right? That's why they're so reluctant to get rid of it. Because it is the disciplining force. Like, within my party, the Labour Party, there's no point in getting upset and leave. Leave, go to where? Do what? We go into the desert outside where first past the post means you can never make a breakthrough? Or it dis and it disciplines the voters as well. Vote for the worst, the least worst option because there's no point in voting for anything else. And they know it is an abusive, disciplining force. And that's why some people, some people in the Labour Party, the ones who are most neurotic, the ones who feel most nervous, the ones without the confidence to open up and have a com conversation and dialogue with everyone else, will cling on to that abusive power for as long as they can. And we must take it from, from them. And we must take that power from them, not in an equally abusive, aggressive, horrible way, but in a beautiful, wonderful way. And the kind of things that Ian and Sean have been talking about, what's happened to the Labour Party, is seismic. The fact that the Labour Party membership, 75% of them now support PR, against the wishes of their leaders, the fact that the majority of the trade unions now back PR, <laughs> is a massive cultural shift in our politics that we can learn from and look from and see hope in the future. That those people who live in the real world, and, and as Ian was saying and Sean was saying, know that the future will be negotiated and not imposed. That is the future of our world and the future of our society and the future of our politics. And that pressure will build up and will keep building up, or maybe we'll come to how that can break through um, at some stage. So look, you know, what does a new politics look like? We know it's much richer, much deeper, much more participatory. I love a thing in complexity theory, there's a thing called Ashley's Law, and Ashley's Law is, is called the Law of Requisite Variety. And all that says is that any entity can only be governed by another entity equally as complex as that. So if you live in a complex society where sort of most of us have got these things, you know, you can talk to each other, you can work together, communicate, you can cooperate, you can know everything, you can talk about anything, you can organise anything. Well, if that's the complexity of our society, and the way it's now broken up away from, as Ian was saying, the kind of 97% voting for two parties, to that fragmenting and splitting into a brilliant, beautiful diversity, which is the only way we're going to deal with the complexity, then you've got to start having a politics which is equally as complex as that. And PR is the starting point of that. As Ian said, it's not sufficient, but it is necessary. You know, uh, Sean's organisation is beautifully termed Unlock Democracy. That's exactly what PR does. It isn't going to change our world over, overnight. It doesn't mean that every country that's got PR is brilliant and wonderful and, you know, everything's perfect. It does mean that this rotten, adversarial, centralised, monopolistic, abusive politics is ending overnight, and then all of a sudden we have the possibility, the chances of something better. We still have to fight for it, we have to organise for it, we have to talk about it, we have to mobilise for it, but we're on a level, a level playing field where everyone's vote counts. And so that every new voice and every bit of innovation and every new creator and every innovator and entrepreneur can come in and pitch their ideas and pitch their thoughts and build up the kind of complexity and richness that we need so that we get the levels of devolution and not just the devolution of decisions but the devolution of money as well. That we move to that kind of citizens' assembly model where people are regularly asked and given the honour of having their voice heard really effectively over 
uh, you know, on detailed policy over a period of time. And then you can start moving into lots of much more interesting areas, like quadratic voting. And all that means is you have your vote kind of has a weight. If you really believe in one issue a lot, you cast all your votes on that issue because you really believe in it. And that kind of starts to give people expression to what they really think. And you move then into this world of liquid democracy where you have a representative and you give your representative the vote. And if you don't like what you're doing, they're doing with it, then you take it back and then you give it to someone else and you pull it together or you use it yourself. This is the complaint. This is all doable in a world of these things. It's all pretty easy and pretty doable. And politics then and democracy starts to be something that we participate in, that we enjoy. And I don't know, Sean, about the term democracy and whether we kind of avoid it or use it or not. It's when people think that democracy isn't just an instrumental thing, it's an intrinsic thing. It's about the power it gives us individually and collectively, the joy it gives us that individually and collectively, that we benefit from the process of autonomy, of deciding what our world and our life and our society looks like and feels like and is like together. That's the most powerful thing about democracy. And when we experience it in our lives, whether it's in politics, formal politics, in the workplace, in communities, and we come together and we decide things and do things, I think they are the best moments of our life. And if we can get people believing more in that, of those best moments in our life, then I think we might be on to something a bit better. Look, I don't know when things are going to change. I think, you know, an experiment, uh, the only thing I remember from school, I, I got no O levels, that's just to show how old I am. The only thing I remember from my, my experience at school was a physics uh, 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 experiment where someone attached a bit of elastic to a brick on a table and you keep pulling the brick with a bit of elastic for ages and ages and ages and nothing happens. And all of a sudden the tension builds and the brick pings across the table, right? That's the only thing I remember, it's pretty <laughs> sad, right? But that metaphor for change seems really powerful to me. I don't know when things are going to change. If you'd have asked someone on the streets of Berlin on the 8th of November 1989, is the wall going to fall tomorrow, they'd have said you're bonkers, right? The things that look completely impervious, the things that look like they'll never change. Our political system is rotting from within because it's unjust, because it's unfair, because it doesn't work, right? just have to keep pushing, or better still with the analogy of the, of the brick, we just need to keep pulling. If we keep pulling, it will change. It has to change. It must change. Because the alternative, right, and this is what drives me, the alternative isn't some benign world of it'll all just about carry on and it won't be very good, but you know, we'll manage. The people waiting in the wings for democracy to fail are the worst kind of people. And they're right. If democracy doesn't stop the planet burning, it doesn't stop the poor getting poorer, if it doesn't feed people, if it doesn't have a, polit if it has a country of love and compassion, then democracy has failed, and we failed, because it's not the best and right kind of democracy. So the stakes have never, ever, ever been higher in all of that perma-crisis stuff. And I look around and think, you know, Wonderful politicians like Caroline Lucas and, and, and a wonderful politician that Nate's going to be in the future. You know, and, and Parliament isn't bereft of that. You know, but then look at organisations like XR you know, and the wonderful things that they do. What kind of new economic movements like B Corps. Changes all around us. All of us live in this world of complexity and negotiation and hope and fear. And we have to find a way of expressing that and showing that and giving that an outlet. We saw it brilliantly in our little way, compass way, in the May local elections, where we organise people to vote and act progressively, not made to stand down. We don't ask people to stand down. We ask them to work cooperatively, you know, to focus their energies to beat the Tories where it's, it's, you know, that, that can happen. And that worked really well. But then you see all the other copycat stuff, where you know, we've helped organise it in some places over years, and then other people say, well, that works. We quite like that. And then despite this kind of, you know, particularly in the Labour Party, the police forces that run around trying to kind of, you know, stamp on it like whack-a-mole, trying to kill the future, it kind of breathes and it grows and it develops. So everywhere in our communities, our society and our politics, this new world of representative, better representative, but post-representative politics is all bursting up and 
coming out because we live in this networked, interconnected world in which we know these crises are going to keep coming. And if we don't do something about it, we have to work. You know, we are, we are in real trouble. So we see politics, you know, we use an analogy in, in Compass, we say it has to be like a pitch invasion. You know, the current law aren't going to change it. Well, if they're not going to change it, we've all got to run on the bloody pitch and change it ourselves and make it happen. So how do we do that and where do we do that? That seems to be um, the question. There's only one good society. It's the one that isn't given to us, isn't spoon-fed us, isn't passed through legislation. The only good society is the one that we create collectively together. And in all of that, I think, Nate, and you're going to be the example of this, the test of the true radical is always to make hope possible and not despair convincing. We now have to make hope possible because despair will become convincing. We have to be, we have to be hope builders around this new politics because the alternative is just so, so much worse. so much Neil, that was fantastic. And you can tell that you've done lots of these because of how much many compliments you give to the host. <laughs> if you ever end up on a panel, it's a really good, uh, really good technique. So. <laughs> I thought I'd get the friendly question. <laughs> uh, we'll see about that. Um, and if you see me taking loads of notes, it is because I am literally writing uh, the first draft of the Green Party's manifesto. So all of these fantastic lines, don't be surprised if you see them again. Um, I did want to just disagree with one thing that he says, Neil, which is always like a dangerous thing to do when you're hosting a panel, which is that Caroline Lucas is retiring from Parliament, but she's not retiring from politics. She might be the first politician that's retiring from Parliament to go and do more politics. She wants to go and create change, and she's decided that Parliament, for all the reasons that we've talked, we've talked about, isn't the avenue through which she can create the change that she wants to see. But if, if you read my piece in The, in the Guardian, it recognises that. Right. Yeah. But what the crucial bit is, if we vacate Westminster, Whitehall and the state, we're, re we're in real trouble. You can't go, I'm going to do, yes, you can do politics outside and that's laudable and good and valuable and right. It's not either or, but we have to have people who want to change Westminster in Westminster. Mm -hmm. And we can't skirt that and we can't say politics is done somewhere else. It is done somewhere else, but it has to be done there as well. Yeah, and, and you are completely right about that. And, and that's why a lot of the time we talk about the Green Party as the political movement of the, of, of the parliamentary wing of the climate yeah. change movement. Because without having those voices in parliament, we won't get the change that we need. And Neil might have just inadvertently given the, the best reason to vote Green at the next general election. So thank, thank you for that. Um, and something else really interesting that you said as well, actually, is that like if this is what democracy looks like, and our democracy is failing, um, then that gives you know the far right an in that we just can't let them have, and that's why we cannot let things stay the way that they are right now, because they won't stay the way that they are right now, because as people are starving, as the planet is burning, people will take advantage of that to take away the shred of democracy that we have right now. So we have to work together to solve that from happening. Um, I think now we're going to move to some, some questions. There were so many amazing things said here. I've got literally pages of it. So hopefully people have some questions. We're going to do some questions now. I think there's a roaming microphone in the audience. Fantastic. So put your hands up if you have some questions. We're going to take a couple at a time. That's OK. So we've got one question here. Um, and then afterwards, we'll have a question back. There, and is there one more question? And then one here as well. Hi, uh, I'm a newbie. Although I've been. So, do you want to say your name as well? Just Ashley. So we know. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Uh, I'm a newbie. Although I've been a member for many years, uh, I've recently thrown myself over the past sort of three months or so into Green Party and have decided to try and be uh, a non target candidate for my ward next year. And there's a lot of questions that don't get answered by Google, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> one being, um, so we have an uncoded um, constitution. And what I couldn't find out was the Human Rights Act and all those sort of things that are in our constitution, 
Were they set by Brussels or were they more, uh, something which we did in the past or what? Is it, is, it is, is, it is it going to still be a human rights under their uh, legislation or do we make our own once we, if we do do a, a, a work, um, sorry, a code constitution? Thank you very much, Ashley. Can we take the, the next question and then we'll, we will answer your question, don't worry. We're just going to take a couple at a time. Sure, <laughs> uh, more. Just at the back here. Thank you. I'm Davina from the Green Party and Extinction Rebellion. Sorry, what was your name? Davina. Hello, Davina. And it's addressed to Neil in particular. He said that current politicians wouldn't change willingly the system and that we needed to run onto the pitch to force change. That sounds to me like revolution. <laughs> what is he proposing? And will he run onto the pitch with me and sit down? <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Davina. And then one more question here. I always want to say the colour of shirts, and then I remember I'm colour blind. And it's not <laughs> just, just there. Hi, I'm David Woolcombe, uh, Green Party Councillor at East Tufts District Council for the Buntingford Ward. And um, I wanted to just point out, as I'm sure you all know, because my day job is working with the United Nations, um, that the problems you describe in the UK are not limited to the UK. There is an Economist Intelligent Unit uh, Democracy Index, which comes out every year, and it says that only 8% of democracies are actually fully functional democracies. Um, the UK and the USA are not one of them. The USA is perhaps even more important than the UK's. There's this ridiculous electoral college that means that though Hillary Clinton and Al Gore and all the Democrats have won, most of the elections by millions of votes, more than the Republicans, they weren't actually elected to the White House. So fully functioning representative democracy is a great rarity in our world at the moment. And um, the other thing that I sort of wanted to mention is that we were pretty pleased when in the United Nations, 141 countries condemned the Ukrainian invasion, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. However, the countries that didn't condemn and abstain represent 65% of the world's peoples. So globally, we have a pretty screwed up population. Now, I don't think most people want to commit suicide. I think most people actually want to have a nice life and be prosperous and bring children into the world and raise families, and that that's what we all want to do globally. And yet, globally, it's far more urgent than you guys have been saying tonight. If you've been watching what Johan Rockström has been saying at the Potsdam Institute, there are nine planetary boundaries. When we announced them in 2008, there were four that were breached. Now there are six, including, of course, the climate barrier. These planetary boundaries are putting us head on into tipping points. So this is not a sort of optional extra. And I wonder what you guys feel about my day job, which is UN reform, and if you see any possibility of the United Nations rising to the challenge of both democratic reform and also addressing these huge issues that the world has to face together or die together. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for, for all that incredible information and for your question about UN reform. Just, just to say, if we ever needed evidence that Greens can win under first past the post, East Hearts, 18 gains in one election to go from just one council, I think, before, to running the council. Utterly incredible performance. And if that isn't a message to join the Green Party today and get involved, because wherever you live, whatever the politics is in your area, it can change really quickly. We can win. We can win. <laughs> um, so, now that the party will supply cuts out of the way, um, <laughs> let's, let's answer some of the, the questions. Who wants to go first? Oh, I'm going to pick one from the other one. one. Uh, <laughs> yes, you can go. Ian, I think you volunteered yourself. The, the, the question, 
quite a slight catch your name to Ashley. Ashley. Ashley's question was about the, the Human Rights Act and how it fits in with Europe. I mean, Britain is a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, and what happened under Tony Blair's government is that essentially that was incorporated into UK law. So it's UK legislation, but you know it, 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 it originates from, well, and we still are a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, and became so in the early 1950s. Um, I, I think I'm Winston Churchill's second government. 1950s. Um, it's a bugbear, of course, in the Conservative Party who would like to um, change those legislative uh, commitments. But we would remain a signatory to the European Convention, uh, even if that legislation changed. Or, of course, the government could decide that we come out of the European Convention, and I think would have seen the same company as Belarus and one or two other countries who were not signatory. Can we get a microphone for you, just because for the recording and for, for, for other people? I'll put it in the to come out of the human rights legislation or convention, that would that would stimulate a, a a challenge under the human rights principles. It is first it is an entity. I'm not sure David will agree with me, so so I'm losing my voice. So um, we are unable to remove ourselves easily from our obligations. We were the only signatories, we drafted it. So it's just a point of information. <laughs> and, and thank God for that, that it's not so easy to leave or it might have happened already. In the of um, and just to say, we are already in company with Belarus of being the only countries in, in Europe that use this horrible electoral system. So we, you know, we've seen how that can go wrong being in company with Belarus, so let's not add to that. Just, um, Sure, yeah. Um, I'll just, I think this, I'll leave the, the English question to Neil because I think that was very much a, a, a Neil question about revolutions. But um, firstly, uh, Ashley, brilliant, if you're going to be a candidate. Um, we need more people to make democracy work. We need more people to be part of it. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, is a real struggle right now is getting more representative people into politics, younger people into politics. Uh, people from more diverse backgrounds into politics, because why would they want to when they look at sometimes at how toxic our politics has become? Uh, and I think that's one of the biggest problems we've got with our system at the moment, in, is that you know, we, we're not getting the right people wanting to get involved in politics because the system's so broken, and that's what, one of the big reasons why we need to change it. So thank you for doing it despite the system. Um, you know, it, it really makes a difference. Um, you know, the Human Rights Act, I mean, the really tragic thing about not having a written constitution in, in, in the UK, which we would want to basically include our human rights would be at the heart of that constitution. Um, it would mean that you couldn't just replace our human rights with a vote in parliament, like you can right now. You know, you, maybe you need a two-thirds majority, maybe you need a referendum to change the constitution, but you have a higher bar for things that are fundamental rules. In, in democracy, and that's the point of a written constitution. You can't just sweep them away because it's convenient. Like in the last few years, we've sort of, we had a fixed term parliament act, so the prime minister didn't have the power to, to choose when the general election was going to be very briefly. Um, and this government decided it didn't like that, so one vote parliament, that's gone, it's taken the power back for, it, for itself. Um, that is not how democracy should work. You shouldn't be able to change the rules to suit yourself. And when you look at the US, if you want to know where you can get to, if you carry on down that path of where you basically you change the rules to suit one side or the other, um, you know, it is a very, very scary place um, where you, know, you have entire operations designed to stop people voting um, as opposed to you know, making it easier for people to vote. They actually want to stop people voting. And they're not even shy about saying it. And I think, just bringing to the, the UN point, I mean, um, personally, uh, I think it's tragic what's happened to the institutions like the UN over the last, I guess, 30, 40 years. You know, when you look at history, going back to the sort of immediate period after the war, the UN was at the centre of so much. And I, I'm not, 
I'm not a historian of this era, but I'm not quite sure when it happened, but the UN just barely is even in the news anymore. And you think so many of the problems that exist in this world, it requires a global approach to tackle them. And I think, personally, I think it's tragic it, it's ended up like this. And I think, you know, the UK and the US ought to be champions for democracy around the world. The world. But they can't be all the time. Their own democracies are in such a complete mess because it undermines everything when you're trying to go and say, look, this is how you should do things. This is how you have freedom of speech. How are we supposed to speak up to China or Hong Kong when we're banning protest from the streets of London? I mean, it just absolutely is, is, is killing us as a potential force for good, you know, not just in this country, but around the world. And I think, you know, countries like the UK and the US should be strong supporters of the UN. And it, it always needs that to sort of perhaps start getting back to the place where it used to be. Um, but I think it's a, always on this space, it's, it's, it's a really dangerous situation. Um, I think your question has been answered actually better than that. I'm really glad to turn it again. Good luck with what you do. Um, in terms of David's point about global democracy, I mean, I think it's, it, it's kind of almost worse than that because even that 8% are probably sort of fully functioning representative democracies. And I think what we've been talking about today is the fact that if democracy is going to have a future, it's got to go, it's got to have effective, proper representation, but it's got to go beyond that as well. Because the days in which we just elect someone fairly and properly and transparently or whatever to do our bidding for us, I think they're gone because we leave, you know, we live in much more kind of less paternalistic, you know, you know, we have a sense of great sense of ourselves and our collective abilities, thank God. So I think we've got to think beyond that. And if we start thinking beyond that, it's the idea that you can outsource the big things in your life <coughs> to someone else. And you, you're not invested in them yourselves, and you're not working on it yourself, and you're not taking active engagement for yourself. You know, whether that's democracy or your community or your workplace or public services, we're going to have to learn that we have to be part of this stuff. And being part of it isn't onerous, it's joyful and interesting and empowering, um, as I suggested earlier. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and at one level, the USA does have a worse system than us because of their electoral college. At another level, they have a much better system than us because they have greater pluralism. Despite the fact there's two parties, what I like about the American system is they've got primaries, so new people can come into the system. They have elections for a whole range of different posts so different people can come in. And their political parties aren't the same kind of relentless, monotonous machine that ours are. They tend to be things that come together at election times where deals are broken and negotiated between different factions. So in America, you see Biden having to um, reach out to Bernie Saunders and the left of his party for ideas and support to win. As opposed to here, you know, Keir Starmer rejects the left and, you know, because it's a completely different system. So there are things about the American system that, you know, that I think we could learn from um, and uh, develop. Um, uh, Davina, my fellow revolutionary. Like, actually, I'm not, I'm genuinely not sure about, I mean, revolution means everything goes around in a circle. I don't want things to go around in a circle. Well, I want them to go off to somewhere um, uh, better, so I'm not sure about revolutions. And pit, uh, the pitch invasion is a nice um, analogy, uh, metaphor, and those things don't hold up to more than two seconds of scrutiny, do they? It's kind of <laughs> strategies for, it's a kind of, to give people a flavour, a sense of what needs to happen. Um, uh, you know, and you know, the, and, and the reason you know we, the pitch invasion is nice because I see all of these political bureaucrats who want to stop you participating, and all, they're the kind of guards on the boundary of the pitch. You know, and my view is that if enough of us run on, and I'm going to run on with you, Davina, you'll be much quicker than me. Um, but, but you know, we're going to run on, and if if two or three of us do it, you know, they'll stop us. A bit. This is you know the XR model, isn't it? But we need to apply that to democracy. But if we all do it. If we all vote tactically, if we all vote, if we all, you know, campaign tactically, if we all back the best place, you know, on, you know, if we all do these things, then, they, you know, they can't throw everyone out of the Labour Party. I mean, they, they might try, but they can't throw everyone out, you know, and you can govern a party by that abusive policing politics 
You can't run a country like that. You can't send a representative of the NEC round to someone's place and say, you've got to do this, you know. So that, that, that sort of dead end, you know, dry, brutal, brittle, desiccated politics you know, isn't going isn't to work and it's going to fall over at, at some stage. And, it, and there is some kind of in and against model there that I think, you know, we need. That's why, you know, it's a shame that Caroline Luke isn't going to be in Parliament because you need those figureheads, those charismatic, powerful figureheads, as well as you need, you know, the people running on the pitch and the people lift, lifting up the barrier so you can run on the pitch and all of that stuff. I'll just finish this bit by saying that the, the organisation and, and person that I most learned from about political change in this respect to feeling like it's impossible, it's never going to happen, it will never work, you know, you're howling at the moon, is obviously Nigel Farage and UKIP. The most marginal issue, ridiculed as a, you know, fringe lunatic, you know, perseveres, uh, builds his own pitch invasion in his own horrible, you know, populist, you know, derogatory kind of way. And I don't want any of that, obviously. But I do learn from his perseverance, never giving up, and going for a big thing. You know, sovereignty is a big thing. It's a powerful thing. It's an emotional thing. It's a thing beyond materialism. And, and you know, many people voted for something beyond materialism. You can go to the wrong rights of it. But to shift an issue from the wacky fruitcake margins, apparently, to persuade a country, however wrong that decision was, there's stuff to learn from that about, about perseverance, about ingenuity, about the way that people like Dominic Cummings run that campaign, about speaking to big issues like sovereignty. And mostly, or not mostly, but importantly, Farage worked because he created that moral pressure he spoke to the heart of Conservatives. He didn't try and make a better Conservative Party. He didn't go and join the Conservative Party. He started something outside that spoke to the moral heart of that Conservative Party and created the electoral pressure which scared the living daylights out of them. It was the by-election in uh, your mate, Sean, um, the bloke who copped up the Stevie. Oh, uh, easily. Easily by-election. <laughs> easily by-election, the, the Tories went from first the second, whatever, to third, third, fourth, and UKIP went above them, and then Cameron gave in on the referendum. It was electoral pressure, because the people who never want to give up, you know, and never, will never give in, the only currency they understand is electoral pressure. So how do we build a moral case for a good society, and the electoral pressure, you know, via the best people in the Labour Party, diminishing numbers, the Liberal Democrats, you know, lots of good people, Sean the best, you know, and the Greens, and others. <laughs> To, to, you know, to do that in and against and have the pitch invasion that's going to work. It's got to be big picture and there's got to be electoral pressure. Um, thank you, Neil. That was fantastic. And just talking about practical things you can do. Right now, uh, the Tories are trying to ban protest in Parliament in a way that Parliament has already rejected. It sounds really technical, but this is fundamentally undermining our democracy. There's a vote on this in the House of Lords tomorrow. Green Member of Parliament Jenny Jones has put forward a, a motion that would stop this dead. Um, if Labour back it, it has enough votes to get through, and Labour don't want to back it. Right now, in this meeting, we've just crossed the threshold of 50,000 people signing a petition demanding Labour block um, the, the mo uh, to, to back Jenny's motion tomorrow. I'm one of them. If you're not one of them by the time you leave this door today, Please come and talk to me. I'll show you where to, to sign the, the, the petition. It's on change.org. It's going up in the hundreds every every sort of 10 minutes at this point. So please do sign that petition. We need to force the Labour to, to, to listen on this. And what you said about, Sean, about um, in the US, they're not shy about trying to um, stop people voting. Well, at this point, they're not shy here either. You've had Jacob Rees-Mogg admit that their attempts to introduce voter ID were gerrymandering. He's willing to admit it now because it turns out it backfired and it stopped the wrong people voting, or, or he thinks it did. But it's still stopping people voting and we still need to stop it. Um, and the Green Party will be campaigning alongside Unlock Democracy, alongside other organisations, to stop voter ID before the general election next year. 
Um, I think we've got time for two more questions, I think. Um, oh, yes. Can we get a microphone to Ashley? Sorry. Baroness Jenny Jones, yeah, Baroness is a title. Um, sorry, they were also, they've now, um, the government have attempted to change a law on a secondary legislation which was held this afternoon. So, so that was a debate in the House of Commons, yes. which because of the Tory majority wouldn't be able to stop it, but the Tories don't have a majority. It's ironic the House of Lords is more representative yeah. of this yeah. country yeah. Yeah. than the House of Commons is right now. Yeah. Um, and we, we can stop this in the House of Lords. She said she was, she was worried that Labour would lose it. Yes, so that's that's what this petition is, is about, to get Labour to, to back um, the, the, the motion. And you've actually just reminded me of something I wanted to say to you, actually, so thank you. Um, thank you for being a non-target candidate. Next year, in North Hearts and um, Stevenage, they need to find over 80 candidates to make sure that everybody has the chance to vote Green. Um, I'm a councillor now. A year before that, I had no idea that I was going to be a councillor or that I was going to be a candidate. It can, it can happen. Um, you don't have to be elected as a councillor, but we do need to give everyone the chance to vote green. Um, there was somebody here willing to talk to people about it. Um, uh, yes, thank you. This, this gentleman over here. If you think that everybody next year should have the chance to vote green, please go talk to this gentleman over here and he'll talk to you about what's involved. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to get elected. Greens have to work really hard to get elected. We just need people to give everyone the chance to vote green. Okay, two more questions, and then we'll let everyone go, go home on this very warm evening. Um, one just... We, we can't stop them going home, to be fair. <laughs> <laughs> just over here. Hello. Um, yeah, it talks a lot about Westminster, but there's some nonsense going on at local government. Uh, Hertfordshire is one million people as a population. Hertfordshire County Council runs education, social care, all the important things, right? That's 78 councillors. North Arts Council runs bins, parks, and a few other things, and like this situation you mentioned with the Greens, that's 55 councillors. So all four parties are running around like mad buggers trying to find candidates for that. It's almost like there's an illusion of democracy to over-represent the districts, which don't control very much, and under-represent the counties, where, guess what, Tories have control. Um, and can we get your name, sorry? <coughs> Malcolm. Um, thank you. Um, I'm actually going to take three questions. There's a lady in the back just over here, and then a gentleman in the front. Dear Linda Elkingham from Long Parts and um, Stephen Green Party. Um, my question is we're hoping we'd like to get the votes to the 16s and uh, encourage uh, greater participation. But what I find is while young people might be prepared to strike for the climate as soon as they finish education, you, not, you don't see them voting, you don't see them being involved. And I've, I've long felt and wished that there was an educate part of the education system was political education. That it's not just important to have English and mathematics, is to tr uh, uh, as in terms of uh, essential subjects to prepare people for life, but they also need to learn about being engaged in the community and society they're going to live in. Um, how can we achieve that to make sure that the next generation actually know what they're coming into? Thank you, dear Linda, and the gentleman at the front just here. And thank you so much for running around to, with the microphone. We really appreciate it. <laughs> just, just here. Thank you. Uh, how about Adrian? Um, first off, thank you all so much for coming and speaking tonight. It's been really fantastic speeches. We appreciate your, uh, your doing that. And and um, uh, thank you, Nick, for for uh, uh, being. Um, one topic we probably haven't touched on is media reform and how necessary or not that is to achieve um, sort of political electoral reform. 
Um, to what extent do you think it is necessary, and if so, what would effective media reform look like? Is that sort of double down or byline, or is it other, you know, more grassroots media? What are your thoughts? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for that. Who would like to go first? Yeah, sure. Huh. Lots of questions. Um, media reform um, absolutely is, is, is absolutely essential. Um, and in, again, in people's con when people ask what concerns the most about the way our politics works, uh, as the number one was politicians not telling the truth, uh, the media was up there soon, up, just close after that, as one of the other major concerns. Um, and I think there's two types of media you've got to look at here. Local media, which has just been systematically gutted um, to the point that there is no real coverage of what councils are up to, what mayors are up to. Um, you know, the, the, the people saw the story over the week about Woking Council going bankrupt. Um, you know, uh, like, you know, they own like 1.6 billion pounds. Um, how has it got to that? Where was the scrutiny? Where was any kind of, you know, um, yeah, that's, that's what the media are there for. And then you have the national situation where, um, you know, again, you can look to America and we sort of see these American news networks like Fox News. They're not really a news network. They are players in the game. They, you know, they're push, pushing a specific agenda. Um, and our print media in this country is the same as that. And, you know, obviously you can set rules about how much people can own as part of you know, what percentage of our media, um, you know, there, there are things that potentially could be done, but as a, as a very, as a British journalist, uh, Mehdi Hassan, who works in the US, who just sort of said, the role of a journalist should be, uh, when a politician says to them that the sky is it, it, raining, raining outside, the job of the journalist is to go outside and check that it's raining. And if it's sunny, you tell people. And the problem we've got with the media now is that they'll just say whatever they've been given, but if that's from their, their side. And they were, they were supposed to be the referees, almost. In, you know, when I first started doing politics uh, like on a national basis, I, I, I was told that they won't print it, it's not true. It has to be true they won't print it. Um, 349 million pounds on, on the side of a bus was repeated thousands of times both on BBC, on, you know, all these things. And it's, it's, it's just so, so broken. And so it, it should be part of, of, of reforms. It's complicated, but you just can't ignore it anymore, both on local and national level. Um, local government, the way our local government is structured is a complete mess, and it's probably impossible to sort out, because it, it varies so much from area to area. Uh, any attempt to kind of like try and impose a one size fits all thing on local government is just going to fail because no one, it will just, everyone will fight it for, for different reasons. Um, but I think the real problem with local government is, is around accountability. Um, and I think the problem sometimes we have with these two councils, as far as the voters are concerned, you know, who's responsible for, for, for you know, the street lights? Who's responsible for the, they don't know. Uh, and so there's no accountability and people get really frustrated. Uh, and councillors sometimes get held to account for things that things they can't do. But as a councillor, I would love to try and do th things on the, these area, areas. But the problem is, either we don't have the money or we don't have the power. Uh, and that's why devolution is absolutely cr critical. Um, and just on young people, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad. What's really, really sad is that we all political opinions couldn't, like, can't agree on this is how the system, the system itself should work. Um, and we should teach children citizenship, not in a party political way, but teach them their rights. But sadly, that has actually become, that might sound really uncontentious, but actually politically now, it is contentious. Uh, and again, if you look across the, to America, they, they don't want kids being told their rights. I mean, some of the stuff that's going on in classrooms in Florida right now is, is just beyond scary. Uh, in terms of the sort of censorship of, of issues, different, different life choices. Um, you know, it is a dark, dark place. Now, we are, we're not quite to that degree yet. Here, here yet, there yet. Um, but what, you know, 
so few, I mean, there was an event last week about voter registration, and there's a brilliant organization, uh, politi Politics for the Many, I think, uh, who are sort of saying, yeah, we're doing uh, piece of education in 70 schools, and you're like, that is amazing. How many schools are there in total? I mean, it's, you know, this is, there are lots of people trying to do really good things in this area, but it, it, I really want us to sort of get to the point where we can actually build a consensus in this country, regardless of which party you're in, about how the system should work. And part of that system should be decent, decent citizenship education. People are told, told their rights, people are given the information they need to sort of hold, <coughs> hold people to, to account. Um, and, and we come up with a way of like, encouraging people to take part in democracy rather than making it harder uh, for them to take part in democracy. But that right now has become a political argument, which is, I think, really sad and dangerous. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to pass it to Ian. Yeah. Can I just come back on the subject of local government, not to answer David's question, but he raised local government, so it's a prompt issue of local government now. Sean, sure, sure. sorry, David was over here, wasn't it? Um, Sean and I were, were talking in the interval and saying that none of us really spoke about local government in terms of proportional representation. But the way our system works in local government is even more horrendous. And I, I live um, in Redbridge, which is a mere one party state uh, as far as the Labour Party um, is, is concerned. Uh, and there are local Labour Party members who I know who that it really should change. In Bronxbourne, not too far from here, 90% of that council in May elections elected what were elected as Conservative councillors. 50% of people actually voted Conservative. So Bronxbourne is a near one-party state as far as the Conservatives are concerned. So local government is even worse, actually, than Westminster is. SDP is working very well in Scotland, and I think local government needs to be part of the, the, uh, of, of the reform as far as proportional representation is, uh, is concerned. I'm sorry for the name problem. No, that's all right. Thank you very much. And just to add to that, I'm a councillor in a, in a borough in London called Newham. Um, Newham, for the vast majority of its existence, has been a one-party state, Labour having every single seat. Uh, when I got elected last year alongside one of the Green, it had been um, almost two decades since there had last been a, 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 an opposition council on, on Newham Council. But even before that, they'd only been in for, for one or two terms, and it was a decade of one party rule before that, and then there was one term with one Lib Dem or something like that, and then it was decades of one party rule before that. The level, and of course they're not getting anywhere near 100% of the vote, and being on the council now, I'm seeing how utterly um, broken politics is in Newham, how officers don't, um, are, are, you know, the, the level of control that is operated on, from, from the top in, in local government is, is and, and there's not the media as well, or, or, or the councillors in many cases to hold it to account. We don't have time now to go into how broken local government is, <laughs> but it is just as, if not more broken than Westminster. Um, Neil, do you... Just really you... quickly, yes. um, just to, firstly to your media point, a area that Sean said was right. I'm lucky enough or not to be the son of a Fleet Street printer. My dad was father of the chapel of the Daily Express back in the 70s, and they had real power. And if the, if the owner was going to put something on the front page that they knew was a damn lie about Labour or whatever, they'd turn off the presses, right? Now, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that they had real power, and, that, and obviously the owners didn't like that, and eventually whopping, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But at least when you had strong trade unions and all that infrastructure of counterculture, you had something both physically they could stop the, you know, the press if they, if they had to, and there was a whole different, you know, way of learning and thinking and whatever. Which sort of takes us to the point about the, you know, the votes at 16 and whatever. It's great, have votes at 16, but it better bloody well be meaningful votes, right? Because, they, you know, they won't do it again. So it's got to be meaningful, right? Okay. Um, and then we've been talking about that. The other thing I'd say about it, though, is that, I mean, it's great having, you know, uh, uh, being taught, you know, citizenship or whatever. Um, but they always say that things are much better caught than taught. 
how do you practice democracy? Not just some boring git standing in front telling you about, you know, the Constitution or whatever, even however much it's time. And I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm only disparaging that. It'll be a really good thing, you know, and if it was done properly. But why don't kids learn how to do democracy? And I would just say, look up a thing called the New School in Croydon, which had to be started outside of the state system because it wanted to be democratic. Um, it's a brilliant place run by a brilliant founding principal where the whole thing is set up on a thing called holocracy, which is where you, know, you have these little circles of people, the kids from junior age sit down with the caretakers and, and, and you know, teachers and sit in circles and make decisions about how the place is run and how it operates, and it's fabulous, right? It's got a completely comprehensive intake, it's beautiful, but it has to work outside the system and they struggle to get funding in. But it's a brilliant place where kids can learn citizenship, democracy and participation and negotiation and compassion and tolerance and respect and love for each other, which is what democracy you know, has to be and can be. So let's, and this is what I want, this is why I get so far, I'll shut up, because I want to get me trained and I'm not going to get it, right? But I'm, so politics, like Mrs. Thatcher said, the, you know, the objective, you know, the, the, the means is the economy, the goal is to change the soul. She wanted to build institutions to bring out the, what she saw the best in people, which was individualistic, selfish, self-aggrandizing, consumeristic, whatever. As progressives, we have to build institutions which we think bring out the best in people. You know, their compassion, their care, their love, their respect, their tolerance, their beauty, their, all of that stuff, right? You have to build institutions which bring that out. And unless we have a politics and a parliament and a government that's going to invest in institutions which are about collaboration, negotiation, compromise, you know, uh, the, the future, the long term, etc., that's what we have to do. If we do that, and, and just do that to you finish, because started with Thatcher, or bit with Thatcher, finished with Thatcher, right? She said that socialism never dies, right? She said socialism never dies because it's in people. And I mean socialism with a small s, not a capital S. The, the willingness to be social and to see the social as the most important. She knew it was part of us, and though therefore she relentlessly tried to kind of block it and stamp it out and play whack-a-mole with it because she knew it was in us, right? And that's the bit that keeps me going and keeps Sean going and Nate going and Ian going and all of us. We know that people have this in, in them and have this capability to be brilliant and wonderful and effective collectively. If we can build a politics that honours that and respects that, then we might get the good society we want. Thank you so much, Neil. Can we get another huge round of applause for all of our amazing team? Sean from Unlock Democracy, we've had Ian from Make Us Matter, and Neil from Compass. Thank you so much, and thank you to Dear Linda and all of the local Greens who've organised this fantastic event, and thank you to you for coming. Uh, now we have three kiosks for you. Thank you for coming, but three kiosks for you. One, if you haven't signed Jenny Jones's petition yet, just search Jenny Jones Fatal Motion, change.org on Google, and you'll find it. Jenny Jones. Fatal motion, change.org. This is happening tomorrow. We still have time to change Labour's minds on this to protect the fundamental right to protest. Second key ask, join the Green Party if you're not already a member. It's, it's from six pounds a year, and even if that is the only thing that you do, it makes so much of a difference. You're joining a community of over 50,000 people across the country. Um, and I know from the members in, in, in Newham how much of a difference it makes to the morale every time we see that number go up. So please do join. And if you've already done that, have a chat with this gentleman over here about being a, a, a non-target candidate at the elections next year. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you all have a fantastic evening. Rest of your evening.